The average life expectancy in developed countries is approximately 77 years old, but the average health span is only 66. The gap between the two is a time where you no longer have the vitality, energy or ability to live life on your own terms. This means that for someone who's now over 30 years old, at least one quarter of your remaining time on earth will be spent in this area. If you're over 50, that number becomes closer to half. I'm going to show you how you can drastically reduce that number by increasing your health span starting today with some simple lifestyle changes. So not only do you add years to your life, but also life to your years. If you're new here, welcome to the channel. I'm Adam, a health and fitness coach with a keen interest in optimizing human performance. I'm doing a doctorate in it, specifically in the area of long-term health and exercise. In this channel, we help you become the fittest, healthiest, and strongest version of yourself with practical science-based advice without the gimmicks. When we think about longevity, we need to understand that we don't just want to live longer, but we also want to be independent, doing the things that we want to do with our lives. In fact, increasing your lifespan without increasing your health span would mean that you just have more time on earth with a poorer quality of life. We want this health span line and the lifespan line to be almost together, meaning that you have a good quality of life for as long as possible. Now, I'm a huge proponent of the Pareto principle, which states that 80% of the outcomes will come from 20% of the inputs. And if you're like me, you don't have an extra two hours a day to focus on your longevity. So let's discuss the big rocks so that you're not stepping over dollars to pick up pennies when it comes to your health. I like to break it down into three key areas, fitness, strength, and health. These of course are all somewhat interconnected, but can be focused on and proved independently of one another. And the starting point is simply to get an understanding of where you are at with all of these areas. For example, for the past six months, I've been learning Portuguese, but the teacher needed to know where my level was at before we began. So we could set appropriate benchmarks, set goals and deliver the appropriate materials. Not too easy and not too difficult. The same goes with your health and fitness. And with that in mind, I've got you covered. Check out 360audit.net or the link in the description. It's a completely free science-based audit that I made. So when I talk about fitness, I specifically mean cardiorespiratory fitness, which means how well your body takes in oxygen and delivers it around your muscles and organs during prolonged exercise. We often see fitness models and personal trainers online who boast about being able to stay lean or to lose fat with little or no cardio. And while yes, it is possible to lose weight without cardio, this is far from optimal for your health and well-being, particularly if you are somebody who thinks in the long term. And the gold standard measure for this is your VO2 max. This measure is the greatest predictor of your longevity. You can get this tested in a university lab or a sports performance facility where they put on a mask and make you run or cycle. Another way that I practically like to measure it is by using 5K running times. This is not perfect by any means, but gives you a ballpark idea without needing to do a test in a lab. A 5K time of 27 minutes will give you about a VO2 max of 38, which is below average. A 5K time of 21 minutes will give you a score about 48, which will put you well above average. And a time of 17 minutes, which is a top 1%, will equal a VO2 max of about 60. At present, I'm currently sitting at 57, but of course, testing is always going to be far more accurate. Now, there are many ways to improve your VO2 max, but I think people way overcomplicate this, particularly those who actually have a major room to improve. Is it zone two? Is it zone five or intervals? Or is it a mix of everything? For 95% of people, just doing more cardio in general of any kind will work wonders. For example, I took my VO2 max from about average of around 42 to the top 3% for my age in just nine months from just running more. I had been playing basketball consistently, but I'd never ran more than 7K. But now I routinely spend about three or four hours a week just running. I will say though that it took me about six months and about two hours of cardio per week to get to that top 10%. Then to get to that top 3%, it took me a further three months and doubling up on my cardio. And if I wanted to get to the top 1%, I think I'd probably need to double my cardio again. And for me, I personally don't know if that's worth the trade-off. Now, if you want practical numbers for cardio, this 2022 paper found that if you want the most benefit from the least amount of time, about two to three hours of moderate exercise per week will get you there. Moderate means something above six mets. Examples will be playing tennis or a very light jog. Now, if you're doing less than this, let's say just walking or playing golf, then you want to be getting about five hours of exercise per week. More, of course, is nearly always better, but going from two hours to 10 hours, which is a 500% increase in time, only has about a 50% added benefit when it comes to future health risk. So your cardiorespiratory fitness or cardiovascular fitness is one of, if not the most important factor for health span. 
With strength, its relationship to longevity is multifactorial. It's not just about having strength to do the things that you would normally take for granted in day-to-day -day life, like opening a jar or walking up the stairs. Doing strength training staves off sarcopenia, which is the natural muscle wastage as we age and is linked with faster progressions of heart disease. Being stronger reduces your risk of osteoporosis, which can lead to increased bone fractures and breaks, meaning less independence. And strength training has synergistic effects with cardio in improving and maintaining your health of your heart and cardiometabolic system. This means reducing the chances of diabetes and other conditions related to your heart and endothelial system. Finally, lifting weights increases balance and fall prevention falls, being the number one cause of injury and death in older adults. I do have to acknowledge my own biases though. As someone who's competed in natural bodybuilding for many years, it's easy for me to just say, you need to go lift loads and gain tons of muscle. But health and physique goals don't scale one-to-one -one when it comes to the amount of lifting that you need to do. In fact, according to this 2022 meta-analysis, you'll get pretty much all of the health benefits from around 30 to 60 minutes of resistance training per week. Now, of course, that does not maximize the benefits, nor will it maximally build muscle and get you a very jacked physique. But if you are tight on time and your goal is to just get the biggest return on investment, simply just two days of resistance training per week with a few exercises will suffice. Fellow YouTuber Dr. Pack actually carried out some research in this area, showing that one set taken close to failure two to three times per week for squat and bench was able to increase strength over time. Practically speaking, I would recommend that you train at least two days per week, or for upper body, you do a horizontal push and pull, a vertical push and pull, and then for lower body, you do a squat and a hinge pattern. And if you're really stuck for time and can't lift weights, exercise snacking could be an option. This is a really new area of research, but it's essentially where you use your body weight or resistance bands just to knock out a few reps a couple times a day. For example, three times a day, you do some push-ups, sit-ups, and air squats. I actually have one of my clients doing this as he's nearly always working on the road and staying in hotels. Now you definitely won't become Mr. Olympia doing this, but it appears promising in terms of muscle maintenance as we start to age. So to sum up the first two, you want to be both physically fit and strong, but where I think most people get lost is they simply just don't give enough time to cardio, or at most, they give equal attention to both cardio and lifting. But based on the scientific literature, if health span and longevity is the goal and you're looking to get the most out of your time, spend about two thirds to three quarters of your time doing cardiovascular training and spend the rest of the time doing resistance training. If you're doing at least one hour of some form of resistance training, whether that's body weight or in the gym or something like that, and at least two to three hours of intense cardio, then you can start to add more of one or the other based on your preferences and your goals. And if you really hate all forms of cardio or are really, really tight on time, then try combining the two and work in some form of hit into your gym sessions. Things like kettlebell circuits, air bikes, and burpees as finishers. So consistent resistance training of about one hour per week will further improve your health span and add to the benefits that you get from doing cardio. Now the third and final category, health, I'm specifically talking about health markers that we know have strong links to health span. Obviously strength and fitness are gonna improve your overall health, but there are key cardiometabolic factors that you should be aware of that most people aren't. And a quote from the famous investor Warren Buffett comes to mind here, it's not how hard you row, but what boat you're in. So many people that I talk to are doing so many unnecessary superfluous stuff that either doesn't just make any sense or they don't have a clue why they're doing it. So they don't know if they're making progress or not. And these things that they're doing often require time, money and effort. So going back to the boat analogy, you don't necessarily need to do more. You just need to make sure you're doing the right things and directing your efforts in the right way. And the first one here is cholesterol. Realistically, you need to get this tested to see where your levels are at because you just can't feel if it's high. The numbers that you wanna shoot for are at least below 100 milligrams per deciliter for APOB and LDL. But everybody, including me, could benefit from improving their lipids. And even if your number is below 100, this advice is applicable to you. Number one, increase your polyunsaturated fat intake. Really easy ways to do this are eating more nuts and seeds, but specifically pumpkin seeds and walnuts. I personally like to add them to my breakfast and salads. Number two, reduce your saturated fat intake as this increases unfavorable LDL cholesterol. So less traditional grass-fed butter, creams and fatty cuts of meat. They're all right in moderation, but just make sure that you're not over consuming them. Number three, increase your soluble fiber intake, particularly beta-glucan. This is a type of fiber found in oats. So simply adding a bowl or two of oats per day can have significant cholesterol lowering effects. Number four, swap out your unfiltered coffee from things like mocha pots and French presses to espresso machines or drip filters. You might not realize this, but there's actually substances in coffee that increase your cholesterol by up to 10% and you need to filter these out. 
And finally, adding plant phytosterols is something that I personally do and has shown to have significant cholesterol lower effects. I personally use something like these Benacol shots, which gives me the recommended three grams of plant stanols per day, but you can use something like two servings of these cholesterol reducing butters as well. If you can start doing some of these today, I would honestly be shocked if in the next one to two months, even without doing anything else, your numbers and ultimately health trajectory didn't drastically improve. Now, the other marker that you need to watch out for is blood pressure, which can cause its own issues, but also worsen the effects of high levels of cholesterol. The elephant in the room, of course, here is body fat. If you're carrying excess body fat, your health isn't gonna be optimal, but you probably know that already. So I wanna focus on the other main contributors to high blood pressure, and that's sodium. Sodium, sometimes just called salt, although technically there are multiple types of salt, it increases fluid retention, constricts your blood vessels and puts pressure on your kidneys. Almost everyone consumes way too much, so it's no surprise that almost two thirds of adults have high blood pressure. And here's something that most people don't know. Potassium actually has the opposite effect to salt. In other words, it lowers your blood pressure. If we look back to our ancestors, they consumed a sodium to potassium ratio of about one to 11, whereas nowadays, the average person consumes a ratio of about one to one. Unsurprisingly, blood pressure wasn't really an issue for our ancestors, and we can see even more evidence of this in modern day hunter-gatherer tribes, such as the Yanomami people who live in the Amazon. They consume about six times less salt than you or I, and they have virtually no age-related blood pressure issues. So if you have elevated blood pressure or you just want to optimize it, focusing on potassium rich foods such as bananas, dried apricots and potatoes, but pretty much any plants in general will send you in the right direction. Another option is packing your bags and move to the Amazon. Two hacks that I personally like to do is swap out my table salt for this potassium rich alternative and I drink beetroot juice daily, both of which help me improve this sodium to potassium ratio. Now, all of these things that I talked about aren't an exhaustive list, but they are the 80-20 of improving your health span, in my opinion. And I like to quote David Allen from Getting Things Done here, you can do anything, but you can't do everything. And where most people go astray is that in pursuit of trying to be perfect, they end up doing some stuff that doesn't really get them anywhere. They forget that they have other commitments and other goals and other parts of their life, and ultimately, they just don't really make any progress. If you can even implement 50% of what I described here, you'll be in a significantly improved health span position and you'll be ahead of 90% of other people. If implementation is an issue, then you can check out my coaching program, Built to Last, and work directly with me on it. And if you want to learn more about what it takes to be in the top 1% for health and fitness, where I go into more details about some of these topics that we talked about today, then check out this video here.